Okay, good morning all. I think we're, I think, there we go. We have all, all panelists online. So initially I'd just like to um, welcome everyone. Craig Thompson here, Medical Access Lead at Canatrek. In assembling this uh, pediatrics panel today, the AIMC is really wanting to offer a, a deep insight into the current and potential role of medicinal cannabis in infants, children and adolescents. And, and to facilitate this insight, um, we put together an exceptional panel that involves Dr. John Tay, Associate Professor Daryl Efron and Associate Professor Honey Housler. Hope I got everyone's prefixes right there. Uh, with this in mind, I think it'd be really beneficial uh, just for each panelist to introduce themselves, their, their work and their interest in the treatment of paediatric conditions with medicinal cannabis. So, um, Dr. Tay, uh, if you could just briefly introduce yourself first. Sure, yeah, my name is Dr. John Tay. I'm um, Medical Director for Plant Med uh, Cannabis Clinics. We're based in Brisbane. And I've got a particular interest um, in paediatric patients, more by accident, I think. Um, after opening up the clinic, uh, we've just started getting more and more child patients. And as the most senior doctor in the clinic, um, I've been taking the majority of that paediatric load. So um, I'm more based on the clinical side. I'm not deeply into any studies at this point in time. I'm just busy working uh, on the coalface, as it were, with these children. So I feel like I might have some good insights uh, into this panel. Thank you, Dr. Tay. And uh, Associate Professor Hasler. Hi, I'm Honey Hoistler. I'm a developmental paediatrician and sleep paediatrician, so do a bit of both. Um, we had a little bit of funding from the Queensland Government about three years ago to start to develop some um, evidence-based practice in terms of um, prescribing CBD um, for paediatric patients. Um, and so to date have run a number of trials um, and certainly a, a compassionate access scheme in intractable epilepsy in children as well with um, a number of trials in Fragile X, Autism, 22Q is recruiting at the moment, um, a couple of palliative care patients we've done some N equals one work in, um, and we're currently also running a tick disorders um, trial as well. So quite a number of trials trying to get better evidence. Um, we are not running any trials with THC containing products um, because of our general concerns and lack of evidence around the potential issues with THC in the developing brain, which I don't think is particularly clear yet. We need to certainly do more research in that space. So mainly clinical trial exposure um, with some very good and promising results in some areas, um, some so-so results in other areas, um, but um, generally trying to get an evidence base out there for um, practitioners to be able to work to. Thank you very much there, Associate Professor Hausler. And finally, Dr. Daryl Efron, um, if you'd like to just briefly introduce yourself and also I believe you have a, just a short presentation um, to offer into the sort of uh, latest research that you're involved in, uh, in relation to medicinal cannabis and paediatrics. Yeah, thanks Craig. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Daryl Efron. I'm a paediatrician, developmental paediatrician like Honey. I'm based in Melbourne at the Royal Children's Hospital and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And uh, I became in, interested in uh, the potential for medicinal cannabis um, for treating kids with developmental and behavioural symptoms, particularly behavioural symptoms, um, really, I think, on the back of the um, paediatric epilepsy work. So um, the only really good evidence in any paediatric condition for any cannabinoid is for two specific paediatric epilepsy syndromes, Dravet syndrome and lennox gastro syndrome, and CBD has been shown to be um, better than placebo for both of those conditions in really good trials. And I see lots of kids with epilepsies and associated developmental behavioural problems. So I start to see some of these kids and 
who are on cannabis um, to treat their seizures and um, they very commonly have severe behavioural difficulties as well. So I was hearing from the parents about uh, some of these kids having behavioural improvements as well. So I started get, getting very interested in and was talking to the epilepsy specialists and then um, subsequently have got immersed in some research in this area. So I, yeah, I've got a brief presentation, I'll flick through a few slides, uh, but we'll leave plenty of time, of course, for discussion and questions. I'll just share my screen. Is my screen shared? Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Oh. No? Okay, what's going on here? Hey, AMC host, do you have any feedback on uh, Professor, Associate Professor Efron's ability to share his screen? No problem. Daryl, it should be on the bottom of your screen, right in the middle, and it should be in green. If it's not, if you want to share it with me, I can share it myself on my screen. If you want to send an email to me quickly. Sorry about this. I've done this before. Successfully uh, share screen. Okay, I'll try that again. Uh, sh oh, share. Okay. Uh, Roger that. Is that working now? Uh, yes. Can you see the slide? Can you see my slide now? Only your desktop. You need to open your slide presentation. It's on another another screen. Sorry, we'll get this right in just a second. I apologise. It's gone over to the other uh, the others. Here we go. That's it. Okay. You good now? Yes. Apologies. Okay. So um, so uh, my research in, in cannabis so far has mostly been in children with intellectual disability and autism, and I'll show you briefly some results of a pilot we've just uh, completed. And, and Mike Honey are also have an interest in Tourette syndrome. We're trying to get a trial up in that area and also uh, Angelin syndrome. Um, I've become an affiliate member of ACA, the Australian Centre for Cannabinoid Clinical and Research Excellence, which is a, a University of Newcastle, an HMRC funded centre. And they sort of, they're sort of an information uh, clearinghouse. And we've recently submitted a paper actually for ethics committees about um, particular issues around clinical trials of medicinal cannabis products and I've done the paediatric part of that and in my clinical practice as I say it was the Victorian Epilepsy Compassionate Access Scheme that got me interested and I've been more recently prescribing for my own patients um, mostly or almost exclusively CBD predominant products but a little bit of THC for some kids with Tourette's and we formed a recently a peer support group for the small numbers of prescribers I'm aware of amongst paediatrics and child psychiatry in Victoria and South Australia. Um, so I've got a few slides which I'll flick through quite rapidly, but intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder um, are a big part of our practice in developmental peds and, a good, and they overlap epidemiologically and clinically, so we sort of group them together. Um, but many of these kids, as you know, have severe behaviour problems characterised by often aggression and self-injury and so on, which are enormously debilitating for the individuals and for their families. Um, and we commonly use a whole range of psychiatric meds, um, which have a lot of side effects, um, such as the antipsychotics, which cause weight gain and sedation and sometimes movement problems and so on. So. Um, Parents are increasingly asking about the possibility of medicinal cannabis as a treatment option. They're hearing about it on the internet uh, and on social media. And social media is full of um, um, parent support groups for different populations, particularly autism. Um, but every syndrome, like the ones Honey's interested in and Angelman that I mentioned, they're all talking about the um, potentially miraculous properties of medicinal cannabis for their particular group. Um, and this is driving some parents to ask their paediatricians about it as an option. Um, but there's very little evidence. So in, in ASD, ID, ID intellectual disability, there's some case reports of good responses to 
certain cannabinoids for aggression or anxiety. And there's just really a couple of open case series, which I won't describe in detail, both from Israel actually of 50 to 100 patients, open label. So these are uh, interesting, but uh, not very high scientific value really. They're not controlled. So we've just uh, published a pilot study of CBD targeting severe behaviour problems in children and adolescents with intellectual disability, many of whom have autism. This is just a pilot, small study, um, children aged 8 to 16 years, um, one to one randomization to CBD or placebo. And the CBD was Tilray's CBD 100 product, which is 98% cannabidiol in, in an oil uh, or placebo for eight weeks. And we used a high dose, we replicated the doses that have been used in the epilepsy studies. Um, which is up to 20 milligram per kilo per day ceiling dose, which is much, much higher than many people are using in clinical practice. Uh, we had a ceiling dose of 500 milligrams twice a day. And the outcome for the pilot was really about feasibility and acceptability, which I suspect may not be of such interest to this audience. You want to know whether it worked or not. I'll show you that in a moment. But the, the pilot's to show, can we put these population of kids through a trial? And so you can see that table there in the left-hand column, we. Um, we were, the outcomes of interest were the recruitment strategy, adherence to the medication dosing regimen, acceptability with study visits, blood tests and so on, and completing the protocol. So before asking for money for a, a big study, which costs a fortune, we wanted to show that we could do it. And the short answer is we could. Every element we looked at, the recruitment strategy, uh, medication adherence, medication tolerance by parent report, um, adverse effect profile very mild, study visit attendance, four study visits over this eight week intervention, um, to, you know, a including a um, recruiting, uh, a screening visit and a baseline visit, um, and blood test completion. There was only one, uh, one patient who couldn't complete one blood test. Um, and the questionnaires were completed online by parents and most of those were completed as well, almost 90%. So, it was a good pilot and we, um, so what about the outcome measure? Well, there are only four on active drug and four on placebo. Um, the dark blue lines is, is baseline and the, and the light blue is, is on active drug. One of the four, so you can see those three all had a good response. There's one standard deviation on this measure called the ABC, Aberrant Behaviour Checklist, is a nine points. So they all had a, more than one standard deviation improvement from baseline to end of the eight week intervention period in contrast to the placebo kids, which didn't, except for one. The fourth one didn't complete the questionnaires, but, I've, but, but the mother was very convinced the child had a dramatic improvement and she's now come back to me and I'm prescribing CBD for that patient. So four out of four responded, as opposed to maybe one out of four, and the mean score improvements were very different. So tiny numbers, as I say, that's not what the pilot's designed to do, but an encouraging signal that CBD may be very helpful for these kids to target their behaviours. So we've been applying for grants and we've, we've just recently got a grant through the MRFF uh, to do a multi-site trial in Melbourne and Sydney of 140 of these patients. Um, it's essentially the same design with some minor modifications um, based on the pilot to a couple of the outcomes and the procedures. I'll stop there, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Daryl, for that uh, fantastic insight into the, the research that you're doing with uh, paediatrics and medicinal cannabis. Um, Dr. Tay, just to open up the, the sort of questions and discussions, uh, within your introduc introduction, you mentioned that um, your prescribing has been, uh, I guess, propelled by the number of patients and, and their children, I assume, coming into you inquiring about medicinal cannabis. Um, the sort of research that uh, Dr. Efron's been talking about, does that reflect what you've seen in your clinical experience? I think, um, I don't think the video is working at the moment. Yeah, um, sorry, sorry Daryl, if you could just stop stare, uh, sharing your screen, then uh, we'll be able to see each other. Stop sharing my screen. Okay, I'll come and get how to do that. Sorry. I'm a bit of a... Spot on. There we go. <laughs> yep. All right, so um, in my experience, yeah, I, I think basically Daryl is on the right path from what I've seen clinically. I feel that the, 
you know, the, the spectrum of pediatric patients in ASD and behavioral and developmental area is so very broad. And um, you do see a large variation between patients and how they respond. The dosing levels which um, were used in Dr. Efron's, uh, Professor Efron's study are very high. Not, not beyond a range of safety or efficacy, I don't think, but well beyond what anyone in Australia at the moment can afford to dose with CBD. So to put that in perspective, if you dose a, a patient at about 200 milligrams per day, so 100 milligrams BD or, or something in that range, um, you're looking somewhere between, say, ten to $12,000 annually. So to be dosing at double that or more than that, it becomes unviable. Um, not from an academic point of view, but from a cost point of view. Um, I would say that in my personal experience, a slight amount of THC in the, in, in the medicine um, seems to be beneficial over mainly 99 or 100% um, CBD preparations. So thinking about that, um, often a ratio of 1 is to 20 THC to CBD works very well. But in the paediatric patient, we... Um, we definitely focus upon um, upon CBD initially, uh, as Dr. Huesler was mentioning, um, for safety reasons. And not that I not that I personally think THC is unsafe in children, but there's no studies that uh, will prove either way whether it's detrimental or beneficial. And I think that also has to be taken into account the developmental delay and situation of each individual child. If a patient is severely developmentally delayed, um, suffering severe dystonia often is the case, or wheelchair bound, is never really going to become a fully functioning member of society. I think that THC is sometimes useful for the relief from those muscle spasms, for the, for the sleep of the patient, for the comfort and reduction in anxiety of the patient. And on the balance of harm versus benefit, THC is not going to be detrimentally affecting that patient's life. So in some cases, I have used THC in varying ratios to good effect. In fact, often very aggressive children in my practice have not really responded to 20 is to 1 ratios of CBD or high concentrations of more um, CBD concentrated medications. And I've introduced a balanced um, THC is the CBD medication on top of their current CBD dosing and had some good response behaviorally there. So reduction in aggression, um, much better outcome for the family, much better sleep. So often these children, because they're unable to communicate their, their pains and their anxieties, um, that gets translated as aggression or meltdowns or any of the other common things that we see in ASD. So in those situations, in an, in, in an individual basis, I... I have experimented with some um, slightly increased ratios of THC to good effect. Saying that generally we get great effects on CBD high medications with a ratio of 20 is to one is very common. And it's a, it's a common medication which I use on, on my pediatric patients. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of room for good studies to be done in this area. But if we're talking N equals one studies or patients, um, I've got hundreds of them at the moment. Um, and on the, on the whole, getting very, very good results with um, various combinations of medications, but generally always starting with a CBD predominant oral oil. Um, I think yeah. um, what you're saying also reflects what we've just found with our autism open label study where we did 50 patients in an open label study. And we had about... 60% of the patients have greater than a 30% reduction in irritability and aggression, um, but improvements across the board in the aberrant behaviour checklist, mm -hmm. anxiety and family functioning and all those sorts of things. The interesting thing has been, as we've been waiting to get TGA approval, a few of those patients have been without medication for up to three to four weeks. And for those patients that had had a significant difference, there's been a significant deterioration once they've come off it as well. So 
that's been quite interesting from our perspective, but we do need the randomised control trials. And the, this question of THC in paediatrics really needs to be sorted out, I think, because it's, it's just such a, a scary thing for paediatricians mm -hmm. in terms of prescribing with the unknown of the um, potential psychoactive sort of components with it in the longer term. Exactly. Um, that's yep. the tricky thing. I think it's it's a call to evidence really, mm. as much as anything. So, you know, when I make these judgments and it's definitely a, a small percentage of patients that progress to a, any sort of higher mm. THC levels, um, they're all run through the TGA and, the, and one of the conditions that seems to be in, um, demanded from the TGA is involvement of the pediatrician or psychiatrist of the child, which I think is a very good idea. I think it does pose some issues though, because of lack of education um, of the general population of pediatricians and, and, and pediatric psychiatrists. Quite rightly, they are a bit um, conservative in, in the use of THC because of this lack of studies. So that often will stop a child um, progressing to THC medications where I personally would see great benefit for that particular child. <clears throat> and this is not something you can do across the board. And a lot of the studies uh, or observational studies that have been done that give people a lot of fear and parents a lot of fear are things that say, studies which say, you know, um, schizophrenia can be unmasked or bipolar manic disorders can be unmasked. And that is true. You know, that is true. But generally, when you look deeper into these studies, they're done on populations where patients are, well, they're not patients often, they're often they're just um, self-medicating with high doses of recreational cannabis well beyond limits that we would um, use uh, clinically for a child. You know, so children are obviously not vaporizing or smoking large amounts of cannabis. We use oral oils starting at one milligram per patient and monitor very carefully these patients for any um, start of any side effect. And if at any time side effects are noted, we simply cease that medication immediately. So there's definitely checks and balances in my clinical method to make sure there's no problems. And so far, I'm happy to say that there haven't been any major problems with any of the small amount of children that are using any significant amount of THC. And I think something I'd like to bring up, which is very important, because we put such a predominance on CBD medications in our treatment of children, often at very high dosages. So, you know, above 200 milligrams a day, uh, Professor Efron's dosing children up to 500 milligrams per day. And that definitely brings into consideration the effects of the liver metabolism of other pharmaceutical medications in particular. So we have to take into consideration any medication which is metabolized by an enzyme known as cytochrome P450, of which there's several isoforms in the liver. Um, they're commonly utilized to break down pharmaceutical medications or activate them. And CBD at doses, I draw a line in the sand, above 70 milligrams per day, may potentially antagonize the effect of the cytochrome P450 enzyme. So there's some drugs which come straight to mind, especially with epilepsy yeah. and, um, and ASD. So phenytoin, epilim, clonazepam, lamotrigine, risperidone. All of these medications are almost exclusively broken down by cytochrome P450. So we can have much higher than expected plasma levels of these medications when we add in high dose CBD. That means we have to monitor them where possible and often need to reduce those medications. I mean, it's not always feasible to blood test a, a patient every week. So basically when I ask the parents, I tell the parents about this potential interaction, I say, look, we're looking for any excess effect from these drugs. So one of the main symptoms will be overt somnolence or extreme tiredness or sleepiness all the time. And that's a sign that, especially with things like risperidone, we may need to reduce that medication and or reduce the CBD medication. So I think it's a very important thing. And it, uh, with, with the potential of CBD to become um, rescheduled to an over-the-counter medication, I think, yeah, that's great in principle. But for paediatric population and any person that's needing high dose CBD medications, yeah. anyone with adult epilepsy or childhood epilepsy, something where medical oversight is very important. I would absolutely concur with that. We've had a couple of kids on high doses that we've had to pull back 
because of abnormal liver function um, in particular. Um, particularly those kids on epilim, their liver function tests have gone off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and one kid we had to actually cease on that. So not without side effects, but manageable if you know what you're doing. Mm, exactly. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, the main drug we have problems with is clobazam, Prisium, which is commonly used as an anti-epileptic. And um, so a lot of the kids we see are on that. And, um, the, you know, the metabolism of clobazam is inhibited by um, CBD. So the families need to know that the kids might get sleepy. That's the main side effect. So we, um, we start with lower doses. Just something I, I suggested but didn't say explicitly in my um, presentation, though, in, in relation to other medications is, you know, I said that antipsychotics are commonly used in the kids we're treating and they cause a lot of side effects. So one of the main advantages um, of, of uh, the successes we've had in treating kids um, with severe behaviour problems, kids with developmental disabilities, is the ability not only for symptomatic reduction, but to get down off risperidone, especially in other meds, and sometimes right off it uh, for the first time in years for, for many of these kids. So that, that's really important because it's pretty nasty stuff. I can just pick up on one other point, uh, respond to what John was saying, and that's um, paediatricians and child psychiatrists' um, uh, education and knowledge in this area. Um, it is a problem where, uh, um, you know, as I said, there's not many paediatricians or child psychiatrists in Victoria uh, and I think in New South Wales and South Australia that, that are, who are prescribing um, cannabis. Um, we're just about to survey, I've got a, a trainee in paediatrics who's about to do a survey of paediatricians and child psychiatrists about their knowledge and attitudes. Um, but it is, we're in, a, we're in a period where there's only small numbers of um, paediatricians, at least I can speak confidently about, who uh, have had experience and who know a lot about this area. And that unfortunately is creating a bit of tension sometimes with, um, you know, general, general practices that have a focus on cannabis like yours, John. And we've had a bit of unfortunate interactions between GPs and paediatricians where the paediatricians have felt under some pressure to endorse the prescribing of a medication, a cannabis medication that they're not familiar with. And I've been approached by two or three paediatricians saying, this is just a really awkward situation. This, this GP is writing to me or calling me and putting pressure on me. And I don't, I don't know anything about this medication. I don't know if it's safe or not. So it's, it's, it's a shame we've got this professional uh, tension happening here. I don't have an easy solution to it. Obviously, education is important, but that is going to take time realistically. I don't know if Honey has a comment on this issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have a comment on that. And I think a lot of that pressure from the doctors, um, the GPs, is coming because they, they're, they're, they're obviously there with that patient and the parents are wanting, they're at the end of their tether often. You know, it's a very stressful situation for the families of these patients. And as you say, they've tried all of these other medications. They've tried these very strong medications with lots of side effects. Uh, and the results in their children are often... I mean, a word that is used a lot is zombie or, you know, they're, 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 not, they're calmer, but they're almost not there. And so I think there's pressure on the prescribing doctor for the cannabis medicines to, you know, try something a little more. And to get past that CBD approval, we do need to get approval from the psychiatrist or, or pediatrician, and it just won't go through otherwise. Um, and so I think there's a bit of familial pressure there. And what, what we do at, at Plant Med is we, we, we do communicate with our referring and consulting um, uh, doctors and specialists and, and, and help provide them with education, have a talk to them. I know I personally talk to them where possible. I mean, everyone's very busy and try to shoot them through some, some articles where possible that might help their education. But I think it's, um, you know, things like the AIMC today that we're doing that are helping bring this to attention of people. And I think if there's any paediatricians or child psychiatrists out there, I encourage you to, you know, do a little research, contact any of the, any of the people involved in this or AM, IMC themselves. I know they have lots of lots of information and get a little bit educated. And the main thing to take from it is that cannabis medicines on a risk benefit profile for a patient are much, much safer than the majority of pharmaceutical medications. So the potential for harm from these medications is low especially compared to the antipsychotic medications and anti-epileptic and seizure medications that we commonly prescribe 
without even thinking about it. Um, and I understand the reasons why it is, yep, yeah, well, you want to be know what you're doing. You want to make sure you're not going to harm that patient. So we're doing what we can. And um, I, you know, I put the invitation out there to anyone listening, please contact me um, directly or through IAMC if you have any questions or would like some direction to some learning. And I'm more than happy to share that. Yeah, fantastic. And I think what I'm hearing here, and it's a common theme of the medicinal cannabis industry, it's been brought up in the chat box here as well, is this juncture between clinical evidence and prescribing uh, within the community in Australia. Um, I doubt there's been another, another medication in Australia that's had so much prescribing with so little traditional clinical evidence. Um, bearing in mind where we are today, uh, what do you believe is the best path forward in terms of bringing this juncture together? I think, um, I'll, I'll, I love talking, so I'll jump in. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you know, CBD medications in low dose are safe to use. So if you're using something like a 20 milligram per mil, 20 is to one CBD high medication, um, which is a common sort of mix for all the producers in Australia. And you use that um, reasonably, you know, it's very hard to get the doses of CBD that are going to interact at liver levels. So for instance, uh, you'll need to have five full one mil syringes per day of that sort of medication to get in liver interactions. The other side effects of CBD are almost non-existent. You know, you sometimes get a little nausea, sometimes a little gastric upset, but there's no psychoactive effect. It's extremely safe. Um, there's no direct drug interactions with anything. It's just through the liver interactions. So I encourage all GPs out there to try just those lower dose uh, CBD medications initially. And you can do that with great confidence and great safety. If you're not confident um, to move past that point, refer to someone like Dr. Efron, Dr. myself or Dr. Hughes or people that are specializing in this area um, where they can really monitor a lot better when we start moving to higher doses. But Although a lot of the dosing of CBD is high and requires, you know, 100, 200 or more milligrams per day, I'd say at least 50% of my patients respond to a lot less than that. And the spectrum of ASD in particular and epilepsy is so broad. Some, some children have, have been diagnosed with ASD. It's merely a small behavioral problem and a, little, a slight tick, whereas some children are completely developmentally delayed and it's a completely different issue. So because of that broad spectrum, children often respond to low doses of, of CBD medication. And the 20 is to one ratio that keeps coming up is a very good ratio that seems to work well. Um, and that, I won't go into it, but that backs into the entourage effect of how cannabinoids and minor cannabinoids and terpenes interact in these medicines. So although we may not be getting massive doses of CBD that we seem to be requiring for great effect from trials, you often get a moderate or good effect from low dose in a very safe way. So I'd encourage GPs in that situation to just try those medications. Um, and if they have any troubles or worries, you know, refer on to someone. Um, Plant Med is a 100% referral based clinic and we, we take standard referrals from all, all doctors and, and communicate back with them and send them progress reports. And I think that's very important in the education of these doctors and them taking that step forward to prescribing this medication, which I am positive will be very, very common very, very soon. And that juncture between evidence and prescribing, uh, Dr. Efron, from your perspective? Well, look, I think what, what John was just talking about, I think the, the patients are going to get ahead of us. If, if CBD becomes a C, uh, an S3, which my understanding is that's likely, uh, I don't know if that's on the agenda for today, uh, then families can just go to the chemist and ask the chemist for, for small volumes. There's some sort of talk of it being regulated a maximum of 50 milligrams per day, but I don't know how, much, how they can police how much somebody swallows or gives to their child. But yeah, relatively low doses do seem to be very safe. I agree, John. Um, you know, um, our perspective as clinician researchers is that we'd like to get as much evidence as possible. Um, not because we think CBD in low doses is unsafe, but CBD in high doses can be dangerous. And, and as we keep saying, THC needs to be investigated systematically, which is not a straightforward thing to do as far as ethics committees goes in paediatric trials at all. That's one of, one of many barriers. So I think, we, I think we'll continue. And, and, and cannabis isn't the only drug where clinical practices 
not actually have uh, scientific evidence. That's that's not that's been common in in, in medicine historically, um, but it is unusual in, in that the level of regulation has been both more and less. <laughs> it feels like it's more because you've got to do an SASB application, and that seems like a barrier. But actually the requirements for a company to get a drug onto the list is very low compared to traditional pharmaceuticals. So it's a bit, it's, it's harder and it's easier, or better, higher regulation and less regulation at the same time. It's all very confusing. So I think we, we can walk two things at the same time. We can gently expand pediatric practice with low dose CBD, especially as we've been talking about, while at the same time doing high quality studies, particularly for the more severely impaired kids, which is the group that I'm interested in. Um, which might require higher doses and may require some THC in the mix. I do agree, I think, with what Dr. Was it Dr. Gould said in the previous session about the terminology is really tricky for me. Um, in particular, when you talk about medicinal cannabis, it's like sort of saying, you know, all SSRIs are the same. They're not. And so it's really about making sure we understand what the different products or different balances of the products and components within the product do. And I think that's, you know, one of the challenges for pediatricians and psychiatrists is that when they hear the term medicinal cannabis, they don't actually know what's within that term because it's a very big umbrella for a number of specific products within that space. And to me, that's one of the biggest challenges, both in how we improve and work with doctors to be feel more comfortable in that space, but it's about the products, I think, describing it within it. If I you know, go to prescribe an SSRI, I don't just prescribe an SSRI and wait for whatever comes. You have to be really specific. And what one trial with one SSRI shows is can be different to what another one shows. And so I think it's really a little bit beholden on the industry and research to actually think about what the product specifics are. And I take the point that there is a whole lot of wellness and entourage stuff, but actually we need to know what those balances are. Um, and I think it's particularly important in pediatrics to understand what the balance is within the product. So that's probably my, my, a little pet thing of mine is that when people talk medicinal cannabis, I actually don't know what they're taking. And 100%. that's the problem. <laughs> 100%. And I think a lot of pediatric patients are self-presenting and then having to coerce their pediatrician or GP into a referral, but they're already using illicit product. And trying to find out what product they're taking and what's in that product is basically impossible. Yep. You know, you can make your best bet, but you definitely can't make a, just transfer a patient across and say, well, that's equivalent to 150 milligrams of this particular product. Yeah. And, and that's almost impossible to do. And I would, I mean, I'm, I think we should almost approach it from the research side of things in a reverse way. Um, maybe talk to patients, uh, talk to doctors who are prescribing a lot, such as myself and the other doctors involved in, in this panel today and say, well, what's working for you, you know, for these pediatric patients? Do you have any products you lean on? And I definitely do. I, and I, I'm of course not going to say which ones they are today, but there's definitely products which I will lean on for anxiety or I'll lean on for sleep or I'll lean on for an aggressive child and then work backwards and do the research on those products see how effective they are and then break down them into their terpene and cannabinoid profiles and work backwards in a retrograde fashion. That may be a way to start because as you say, the spectrum of cannabis medicines is almost infinite and yeah. the components of those medicines are purely dependent on the producers and which uh, chemovars and strain selections they've started their medication with and then how they've extracted those medicines. Yeah. For instance, the silicon the study, sorry. Often reduced in the extraction process unless they're removed first. So there's a lot of finesse. And yeah, medicine, medicinal cannabis is not one, one thing. The Pelican study that um, the Lambert Institute put out interviewed a whole lot of families and analysed the product mm. of each of those, what they were taking. I don't know if you've seen that. I'm familiar with that um, one. Yeah, that um, was attempting to try and work out what was working 
um, a little bit, but I don't think they quite got the numbers there. No, and also it was you know, that was all done on illicit medications as well. Yeah. So, you know, they were not what was written on the bottle. Only one of those medications out of, I think, are they 30 or so they tested was actually a high CBD 20 to 1 ratio of medicine. There were some which were just oil, olive oil. There were some which were extremely high in THC. Yep, absolutely. And there were some which were very low or non-existent CBD. Yet across the board, the self-reporting of those families was that they were getting benefit from those medications. I know. Yeah. Placebo effect, is THC working? There's a million questions brought up by that little study rather than answered by it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And look, at this stage, I just have to, it's been a very stimulating, lively and educational conversation. We, we have boldly run in to lunchtime. And uh, look, I've just got to thank so much all the panelists. Uh, there is a couple of questions in the Q&A, et cetera, that we'll try to follow up on that we haven't had the opportunity to discuss. Um, I, I feel like this conversation could have gone on for hours had we let it and uh, it would have been a, a fantastic thing to happen. But once again, thank you to all our panelists and uh, I hope the, the rest of the day is just as, um, as stimulating and entertaining as this one. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.